We appreciate their recognition of our interest and our oversight responsibilities. This is a crisis that is evolving quickly. Uh, since uh, our hearing yesterday, the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus outbreak a global pandemic. CDC has now reported that we have almost 1,000 confirmed cases. That is up from 100 reported cases a week ago, a 900% increase. Americans are worried. They are scared. It is essential that we are able to hear directly from the health officials leading this effort with uh, just the facts. I'm going to go to the Republican side first, which is where we left off. Before I do that, I, without objection, uh, the following three letters we sent on March 3rd to HHS and CDC requesting basic information, including about testing, are entered into the record. We have not gotten any response uh, to those letters, and with that, I recognize Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Fauci, gentlemen, thank you for returning today. And let me ask Dr. Fauci, do you lead the, the executive's task force regarding the, our nation's response to coronavirus? No, I don't, sir. The, the, it, your, your, your status is, is what on a task force? No, I don't, I don't lead the task force. The task force is led by the Vice President of the United no, States. Together understood, with but you're, you're the lead scientist. Is, is well, no, we have several scientists. My we have myself, we have Dr. Redfield, we have Dr. Burks, we have Dr. Cadlick, we have several scientists. Right. They, the, the scientists I've spoken with in committee see you as the lead man, and I believe most of America does. And we greatly respect you and these gentlemen being here today. However, let me clarify for America watching that, that uh, according to the rules of this committee, members have the opportunity to submit our questions in writing. And given the nature of this challenge and the President's announcements of last night, uh, with all due respect, Madam Chair, I, I believe that this, this hearing should have been canceled or postponed. These gentlemen should be able to go and do their work. It, as a time there's a time in battle when you need your, your front-line men on the front line, not in the rear with the gear. And it, it, these gentlemen showed us great respect to be here today. An oversight role is incredibly important, but you gentlemen have work to do. I'll be submitting my questions in writing, and we, my office will publish those questions and your answers in a press release at a later date. Madam Chair, I urge you to consider adjourning this hearing, and I yield the balance of my time to the ranking member. Thank the gentleman for yielding. I would now yield to, the, if it's appropriate with the chair, I would yield to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Green. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ranking Mayor, Member and Mr. Higgins. Uh, my first question is for Mr. Cadlick. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about PPE, if I could, uh, and a concern about liability and the liability protections that might be very important for, uh, you know, the fact that w this is such a catastrophic event and we are we are pushing to the extreme our stocks on PPE. If you could comment about that and specifically the liability issues. Yes, sir. Uh, you're correct that there is a great uh, demand for personal protective equipment, particularly respirators, N95 respirators. Uh, there, uh, we have a limited supply in our strategic national stockpile. Uh, annually, about 350 million respirators are used. Only a small percentage of that is used by the healthcare uh, industry, about 35 million. And we believe that the demand for that could be several hundred million to up to a billion in a six-month period. So it's a very high demand item. Uh, there has been a strategy to basically, uh, and CDC has provided guidance on reuse. How can we use them longer? We've gone to the manufacturers and how they can surge more, and many of them are doing that. And domestically, even though some of their sources for product, finished product, is from overseas like China, and then the third thing is, is what can we do to basically use masks that haven't been used for the medical area? Non-medical N95s could be do, uh, could be used in that fashion. And FDA has basically certified through an emergency use authorization that N95 respirators used in manufacturing and in mining and in construction could be used in healthcare settings. They're very similar but not the same, but could be used that way. And the only thing that's keeping a lot of manufacturers from selling those masks to the broader healthcare population is because of liability provisions or lack of liability protections. There is the Public Readiness Emergency Preparedness Act that was passed in 2005 that basically indemnifies manufacturers, distributors, and users of these masks 
or pardon me, of users of products that are defined as a device or as a covered countermeasure. When we, and so I happened to be on the staff uh, that did that legislation in 2005, we did not consider a situation like this today. We thought about vaccines, we thought about therapeutics, we never thought about respirators of being our first and only line of defense for healthcare workers. So we think that's a very important capacity and capability is to include language or, or modify the PREP Act to include language to include respiratory protective devices for that purpose. And that's a significant critical pass now item. Thank, thank you very much for that, uh, for that answer. Dr. Redfield, I, I had a bunch of constituents uh, ask me uh, after yesterday's hearing, uh, what's the difference between a public health lab and a commercial health lab? Now, everybody in this room kind of understands that, but would you, for the record and for the folks that are watching on TV, make the clarification between those in the few seconds I have left? Thank you very much. We have a series of public health labs throughout this country whose primary purpose is to do surveillance, to kind of get eyes on what's going on in the community. And CDC has worked cooperatively with them. As you know, about 70% of our funding that we get from you all is then distributed to the state, local, territorial, tribal health departments, including their public health labs. There's also clinical medicine, the practice of clinical medicine, the private sector that actually tries to provide diagnostics so we can diagnose diabetes or anemia, lots of different diseases. And it's really the engagement of the private sector to get these tests into clinical medicine, which is, it's a partnership between the private sector. CDC usually develops the test first, gets it out into the health departments to do surveillance, and then the private sector comes in to provide the, the clinical tools we need to basically diagnose patients, not the surveillance of the community. Okay, thank you. Uh, the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Redfield, yesterday my colleague, Mr. Raskin, asked you about a nurse in California who was quarantined after treating a patient with coronavirus and showing symptoms of the disease herself. She couldn't get tested, if you recall, even though her local public health department recommended one. Mm -hmm. She said this, and I quote, the public county officer called me and verified my symptoms and agreed with testing, but the national CDC would not initiate testing. They said they would not test me because if I were wearing the recommended protective equipment, then I wouldn't have the coronavirus. Dr. Redfield, when you were asked about this yesterday, you said this, and I quote, this is a misunderstanding if it did occur. You testified that, quote, the test was always available in Atlanta, where CDC is located. If you sent the sample to us and there was never a time when a health department could not get a test, they had to send it to Atlanta. You claimed that CDC's testing criteria never placed restric restrictions on who got tested, rather that that was only guidance, and quote, we always left the discretion to do testing to the local public health group. So the committee staff reached out to National Nurses United, the union representing this nurse who was not able to receive a test. And they sent us the following statement last night, and Madam Chair, I ask unanimous consent uh, that this statement be entered into the record. So granted. According to National Nurses United, in recent weeks, our union has been made aware of multiple circumstances, and the statement is up on the screen, multiple circumstances in which healthcare workers have been exposed to COVID-19 infection and have not received COVID-19 tests despite requests for testing. They continue. There have been too many cases where exposed healthcare workers have been refused testing for this to be considered a misunderstanding. Further, members of our union across the country have reported countless cases in which testing has been refused to patients when clinicians have recommended it. Dr. Redfield, the national union that represents nurses across this country just issued a statement publicly contradicting your testimony yesterday before this committee. So I ask this question, will you admit that there is a serious problem in this country with individuals, even healthcare workers, obtaining access to testing for coronavirus? You have to turn your mic on. Thank you for your question, uh, Congresswoman. You're welcome. Uh, I'm going to be looking into this in depth, as I said yesterday. Um, clearly, we need to protect the healthcare workers on the front lines. Um, in general, these are local decisions on which healthcare workers need to be tested and exposed by okay, the. Okay, but these are workers, th these, these are people who contacted CDC, and it's CDC that they say turned them down and said that they couldn't be tested. And, and I will look into that in detail and get back to your office or in a, in, as soon as I can. Well, as soon as you, I can, you can, hopefully, will be today. There are countless more examples of problems with people getting access to tests all across the country, including in my home state of Florida, 
We need to have someone in charge of making sure that as many people as possible across this country have access to getting tested as soon as possible. Who is that person? Is it you? Is it the Vice President? Can you give us the name of who can guarantee that anyone, but especially healthcare workers, who need to be tested can be? As I tried to explain to Congressman Green, uh, from the CDPC perspective... Okay, I'm asking for a name. Who is in charge of making sure that people who need to get tested, who are indicated to be tested, can get a test? Who? Yeah, I was trying to say that uh, the responsibility that I have at CDC is make sure all the public health labs have it, and they can make the judgment on how they want to use it. But they're referencing people who have been advised to be tested to you, and they've been turned down. So is it you? As I said, I'm going to look into the specifics. I know that. So, so basically for, you're for, saying, for, for, for claiming my time, basically you seem to be saying, because you can't name anyone specifically, that there's no one specifically in charge that we can count on to make sure that people who need to be tested, healthcare workers or anyone else, there's not one person that can ensure that these tests can be administered. Yes or no? My colleague is looking at me to answer that. <laughs> mm. Here we go. Okay. All right. So, and I do have another question, so I, if we can kind of get so to the, very quickly, the question. So very quickly, the system does not, is not really geared to what we need right now, what you are asking for. That is a failing. And a that, failing, yes. It, it is a failing. I mean, let's so. admit it. The fact is the way the system was set up is that the public health component that Dr. Uh, that, that Dr. Redfield was talking about was a system where you put it out there in the public and a physician asks for it and you get it. The okay. idea of anybody getting it easily the way people in other countries are doing it, we're not set up for that. Do I think we should be? Yes, but we're not. Okay, that's really disturbing and I appreciate the information. Madam Chair, if I can just quickly ask my other question, which was the question I wanted to ask yesterday. We have four, in my home county, we have four positive Port Everglades workers who were po tested positive for coronavirus. These employees, according to our State Department of Health, likely contracted the virus with interactions with infected passengers on ships that they were working at the time during their shift. Ships that held six to eight ships that, that likely held upwards of 50,000 passengers. The people on these ships who were potentially exposed should have been notified so they could have taken swift steps to protect themselves and others. They deserved to know that they'd been exposed to someone with the virus. Yet when I asked our Department of Health what steps were being taken to determine who came in contact with these employees, when I asked the port, the cruise lines yesterday, the State Department of Health, the department was not forthcoming, didn't direct the cruise lines to notify the passengers. Instead of being forthcoming with me, the public and those passengers, I couldn't get a straight answer from the Department of Health, and they said that they were going by CDC guidelines. So Mr. Redfield, what, or Dr. Redfield, what are the CDC guidelines for notifying people who have potentially been exposed to a confirmed coronavirus case? And shouldn't passengers on the relevant ships worked by the Port Everglades employees who have coronavirus been notified in a timely manner so they can take precautionary measures? They still haven't been notified. Thank you very much again for, for both your concern and your question. I know you got a chance to speak to uh, Admiral Red, I think, yesterday about that. Yes. And CDC last night spoke with the Princess Cruise staff about this situation. Uh, they agreed to send a notice to all passengers uh, on the ship uh, where the greeters have worked. We're obviously in, in contact today with the Florida Health Department. Um, we would concur that individuals that have been exposed, um, uh, particularly in a cruise setting, should be notified. I think the controversy here uh, Congressman, is it's, I think the state actually thinks they may have gotten infected in the community, but I think we should err on the side of concern and get these passengers the notified. State, respectfully, the State Department of Health specifically said in the epidemiological study that they did, they had not tra these, these employees had not traveled internationally and they had not had contact in the community with anyone with coronavirus. And so yeah. now days and days have gone by, thousands of passengers floated around the ocean with, with people who had coronavirus likely on the ship they were on, and days and days have gone by with no notification, no precautions that those, pa that those passengers should have taken, and they could be out there spreading coronavirus right now, and the, today, to this day, the cruise lines still have not been notified and urged by any public health entity to notify their passengers to make sure that they can figure out whether they've been exposed. My only comment was after you brought this to uh, Admiral Red's attention, we did have that conversation, and the Princess cruise ship... Not just Princess. 
This is, this is the, 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 the member's time has expired, but the witness may answer, answer the thank question. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just said that uh, based on that, uh, the, the, uh, the company, the, uh, the cruise ship staff, uh, agreed to send a notice to all passengers that were uh, on a ship in which any of these greeters worked. Madam Chair, I just want to point out, it was not just Princess Cruise Lines. This is the, the second largest cruise port in the world, and there is more than just Princess Cruise Lines that these, that these employees worked. We will follow up to see with the state that any, any ship that had passengers that these individuals uh, could have exposed will be notified. Thank you, and I deeply appreciate the member's indulgence. Okay. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Norman, is recognized uh, uh, for uh, the equivalent time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, point of order, do I get seven minutes? Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I just want to thank each and every one of you for coming here. I agree with my uh, Congressman Higgins that you know, y'all need to be on the front lines. I admire you for coming in here. There's nobody watching across this country that has listened over the last few days that doesn't recognize you're doing all you can do. There's certain people, there's certain groups that want to find every fault. We're on uncharted waters here. Y'all are drinking not from a fire hydrant, but from a tidal wave. I respect and admire what you're doing. So please know the majority of the country understands why we weren't uh, aware of, I mean, we didn't, we didn't uh, anticipate this, y'all are handling it, and we, we do appreciate it. Uh, first question, what, I just met with a company, um, Fortune 500 company, who uh, is looking at uh, testing their employees as they come in the door, and yet their concern was, one, frivolous lawsuits, class action suits by trial lawyers, HIPAA violations, health violate, you know, you just can't take temperatures of people without all type, getting into all type uh, of issues. What would, you, for any of you, what would you say for them to do? The CDC has published uh, our guidance for businesses. I encourage them. I, I heard the first day it got over 500,000 downloads. I would like people to really look at that guidance carefully. Secondly, there are complexities, as we already spoke about, uh, testing, um, probably most importantly, that a number of people could actually have this virus and actually have no symptoms. The, the other reality is when the test turns positive after you actually are infected is still a scientific question. I can defer to Dr. Fauci. Um, so at this stage, we really would like to see the test provided uh, to those individuals that feel they were exposed in the clinical setting. As we, as we continue to try to expand that, those individuals that obviously are presented with flu-like symptoms in the hospitals, uh, obviously we want to see the test used for broader public health surveillance. I think that's the stage we're in, but I'd like to see if Tony wants to add something. No, it is. There, there are two types of situations. Uh, Dr. Redfield described one, which was the classic tried and true CDC-based situation where it's based on the doctor-patient interaction, where a doctor, as a patient who wants to get tested for cause, they're sick, they've been exposed, or what have you. That works well. The system right now, as it exists, of doing a much broader capability of determining what the penetrance is in society right now is not operational at all for us. And what the CDC is doing now is that they're taking various cities, they started with six, and then they're gonna expand it, where they're not gonna wait for somebody to ask to get tested. They're gonna get people who walk into an emergency room or a clinic with an influenza-like illness and test them for coronavirus. If you do that on a broader scale throughout the country, you'll start to get a feel for what the penetrance is, and that's a different process. Unfortunately, our system from the beginning was not set up to do that, and that's the reason why we're not able to answer the broader questions of how many people in the country are infected right now. We hope to get there reasonably soon, but we're not there now. What is your opinion on the question I was asked uh, by this employer? Do I give, do I take the risk of when you walk in that door, no symptoms, you just see what, uh, whether it's a temperature or whether it's asking questions, they are petrified of the, of the outcome if they do that. They're also petrified 
of somebody having the virus when they walk in the door and then being held liable uh, if they infect. And this, this, this company has 500 employees that do shifts, working uh, three shifts. What would you, what's your advice? You know, at this point, our, our strongest advice is that people that are sick need to stay home. Those companies that are in areas where we're having significant cases, if they can, you know, telework, uh, we're recommending that. Those companies that are aware with cases, we're asking for social distancing. We're not asking for everybody to come at the lunchtime and sit at the same table. We put out a series of guidelines, but what we're not advocating, you know, and obviously individuals that just returned from Italy or France or Germany, we'd like them to stay home for 14 days. Uh, but we're not advocating the use of these tests in a, in a broad way in the absence of uh, a relationship with a physician or public health official to make that determination. Um, second question. We've got probably 80 people in this room. Uh, the questions that I'm getting, getting asked, what are the, in this room today, what are the likelihood? I don't know, what, who, I don't know who's got what in this room. Walk me through the, um, the likelihood of any one of us in this room uh, getting the, the virus, assuming somebody here has the symptoms. Again, still the real risk uh, in, in, in general right now, and this is why the president took the action he did last night, um, within the world now, over 70% of the new cases are linked to Europe. And in the United States, I think it was now 35, 30 states in our country, 30 of our, uh, 30 states or more were, were linked actually to cases of Europe. Europe is the new China. And that's why the president made those state, uh, statements. Um, clearly, we can only continue to emphasize the, the basics that we've all said about washing your hands, obviously staying away from people who are sick, learning how to cough correctly, don't touch your face, although we all know it's very complicated. Um, I, you know, to try to uh, not touch your face during the day. But I think it's really important that we also are moving quickly with uh, broader mitigation strategies based on the virus, and Tony may want to add to this. So some of that is really encouraging social dis distancing in the workplace, really encouraging social distancing in restaurants, really encouraging social distancing at sporting events. So Tony, you want to add? Yeah. So, sir, it's a great question because you're right. Everybody's asking it. And the issue is, in the spirit of staying ahead of the game, right now, we should be doing things that separate us as best as possible from people who might be infected. And there are ways to do that. You know, we use the word social distancing, but most people don't know what that means. For example, crowds. Um, we just heard that they're going to limit access to the Capitol. That's a really, really good idea to do. I know you like to meet and press the flesh with your constituencies. Not, I think not, you, not now. I, 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 think you need, I, need, I think you need to really cool it for a while because we should, we should be practicing mitigation even in areas that don't have a dramatic increase. I mean, everyone looks to Washington State. They look to California. They're having an obvious serious problem. But their problem now may be our problem tomorrow. So we've got to act like there's going to be a problem. And that means doing everything you possibly can to do the guidelines that the CDC puts up, which sound very simplistic, but they're really important. Common, common sense. Common sense, yes. Finally, I know when this first became public, you, we, uh, I think this country had test kits out to, in, in an effort to find a vaccine to those willing, I guess, to be tested. Where are we on that? I want to just sort of stress the complexity of getting tests, as we've heard from a number of your colleagues, is not just about having the reagents that CDC originally made for a test. Um, you, you obviously need that test kit, and we've put out in the public health system over 75,000, so the public health labs have that. But the public health labs actually have to have the people to do the test, and what is their capacity to do the test? They have to have the equipment to do the test, and what's the capacity of the equipment they have? They have to have some of the early reagents that they need, uh, not to get too technical, but you got to extract nucleic acid in order for the test to go into our kit. So there's a whole system 
that we can see that there's different, you know, limitations as we expand, expand, expand. CDC, I tried to explain why we use the system we did, which is a, uh, you know, a thermocycler system, which is not a system that you can do, you know, tens of thousands of tests very easy. You're really limited some labs between, say, 20, 50. CDC can do between 300 and 350 a day, okay? There's other systems that can do really thousands, okay? And those systems are what are coming online with... Uh, with LabCorp and Quest, and it actually New York State really recently got approved to put their system online. Um, so I want people to sort of understand that, you know, that that whole that whole scenario in terms of app actually. And then, you know, one of the great things about LabCorp and Quest coming in is they already have the distribution system, the collection system. So the more they get into the clinical marketplace, the faster the American public are going to get access to this. I just want to thank you, and Madam Chairman, I appreciate you letting me have eight minutes. Uh, thank you so much. Thank each one uh, of you. You're getting some uh, good questions and good answers. Uh, the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Mr. Welsh, is uh, recognized for five minutes. Uh, uh, thank you very much. You know, the question for us now is what can we do and how best do we do it? And if I understand, and this is directed to Dr. Fauci and Dr. Redfield, is that the two essential things are testing and the social distancing or quarantine or separation, keeping us apart from one another. Is that more or less correct? Yeah, I would put the social distancing and other, other issues of preventing infection ahead of the testing, but the testing is very important. Don't All right, me, and let me go on the testing, because I, I heard two different emphasis uh, from each of you. Uh, Dr. Redfield, you were, as I understood it, focusing on the doctor-patient relationship and the doctor triggering the test in response to a request from a patient. Dr. Fauci, what I understood you to be saying is that surveillance testing is very useful, and right. we're seeing that right. with drive-through testing. Is, is, am I correct in uh, 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 describing a difference? Yeah, yeah there, there is a difference, but we should be doing both. Well, that's what I'm yeah. saying then. Do you right. agree with that, Dr. Redfield? Yeah, I, I, CDC is, you know, we have a ra multiple surveillance systems for respiratory disease and flu. I think we have, you know, multiple different systems we use. Along we, we don't want to hear about that. We got to, no, this we're, is we're, right now with this we're, virus. What should we're moving, we be having our states like Vermont be doing surveillance testing and figure out how to do that in the next question? What I was trying to say is we're now moving our, our, uh, the COVID-19 into that system. We started with the six. We're going to expand jurisdictions. We right, put so yes or no, should we, in addition yes. to be doing yes. the individual testing, the surveillance testing? We should be doing, we should be doing both. I agree okay, with Dr. So, so information, data is right. power, correct? It's, it's, it's critical, and that's what I've said, I think, at the last part of the hearing as you now. You did. The, the system was, was geared for the individual doctor patient. What we're right. going through now transcends that. We need right. to do more There's than that. There's a public health issue. So it, the, a person who presents has got a problem, but it's a problem that unfortunately that individual is gonna share with a lot of other f uh, folks, and, correct? Yes, and when that individual is confirmed, right. it triggers the public health response let, around that let, individual. Let me keep going, because one of the things we have to get here, all of us, represent folks who are going to be getting sick. So this is a, not a red state, blue state type of deal. We're all in this together. And in fact, if we're not in it together, we'll all get sick together. So on this question of travel, which is one of the big issues, you know, the president uh, is banning travel from a number of European countries. Does it make sense to exclude uh, a, a single country, uh, Great Britain, D Dr. Redfield? Is there a medical reason to do that? We were looking at the extent of new cases in different areas, and the re re reason that Schengen area, because there's no borders. We, I don't have that much time. Okay. I, I'll tell you. I'm mystified. If you have a number of European countries where there's a travel ban, I can accept that if that's a medical recommendation about how to combat this. But then you have one country that's singled out for exemption, even though the cases in that country are higher than a number of others, how does that medically make sense? I'll ask you, Dr. Fauci. Well, I'll do it quickly, hopefully. So when we were looking at the pure public health aspect of it, we found that 70% of the new infections 
were coming from, of the new infections in the world, were coming from Europe, that cluster of countries. And of the 35 states, 30 out of 35 of them who were more recently getting infections were getting them from them. That was predominantly from Italy and from France and from Germany. Okay, thank so you. So when did this, no, I mean, there, there is an answer to your question. Okay. So when the discussion was, why don't we just start off and say, ban from Italy? We were told by the State Department and others that in fact, you really can't do that because it's sort of like one country, the whole European thing. And the reason I believe that, that the UK was left out was because there is a difference between right. the ease of, transla of, of transportation between the European countries and well, the that's, UK. That's Brexit. Let, let, thank you. But let me go on to my last question. My understanding is that the best preparation is advanced preparation. I mean, it turns out we don't have the tests that we need. There's a lot of confusion about it. If before this virus hit us, we had those tests in place, we had systems and backup plans in place, that's where you get the head start to keep that curve lower. I'm going to ask you, as uh, Mr. Curry, as the head of, uh, of GAO, was it helpful in our advanced preparation to have disbanded the National Security Team, Global Health Security and Biodefense Directorate? Uh, no, sir, I don't think it was. I mean, we, we and others have recommended for years that there has to be some sort of central coordinator above the departments and agencies because the departments and agencies can't tell each other what to do. All right, do. I'm going to finish. Th that is one thing that is on the administration. I don't, Chip, or Mr. Roy, I, I agree with you, but I say we ought to put that back in place. We got to be prepared in advance, and I hope we could work together to do that. I yield back. Gentleman, time's expired, and the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy, is recognized. I thank the gentlelady. If I might, uh, reserving my time for a minute, I, I do want to make one observation that, um, I, first of all, I want to thank the chair. I think it was important that the, the, the witnesses come back today. Uh, and I would respectfully disagree with my colleague from Louisiana. I think it's important that we hear this because you've got 435 members of Congress who, are, who importantly have to go home and explain to our constituents what's going on. So I think this is very important that we have this hearing and continue to have it and thank the gentleman for being here to do that. And secondly, I would observe that when we have these six and seven minute intervals, uh, like Debbie, or the gentlelady from Florida was able to explore the questions long enough to get responses and have a back and forth. And I think these, that's important. I think we ought to have that kind of a dialogue instead of we get in these short increments and we're firing away in order to get our camera time and ask our questions. So I appreciate having that flexibility. I think that's a good thing is what I'm saying to the chair and I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, back to so on my times, I would say, um, first of all, thank you to Dr. Cadillac, Dr. Rosh, thank you for your time yesterday. You addressed the issue that we were dealing with in San Antonio. I think that's a good example of how the administration can respond and deal with, with these kinds of issues, and I appreciate you doing that. We've, we've, we've resolved that. Thank you. Uh, or at least I, I think we have. Secondly, our job as leaders is to present, in my view, calm, resolve, focus on the facts and to go through this so that, we, so that the American people know that we're on top of this. And I believe that we are on top of this, but we're trying to move forward positively. Um, I think we need to, we know now, we need to minimize social engagement while importantly maintaining commercial activity. Our lives depend on vibrant commercial activity. So we have a responsibility to talk about this in a rational and sane way so that we maintain commerce, the very commerce that will save lives, the very commerce that will allow us to be able to produce wealth and opportunity and create jobs and be able to pay for things while having the kind of social distancing that the gentlemen are referring to. We've got to come up with, with, with ways to do that. Um, last night I spoke on the phone with Dr. Shuren at the FDA uh, and got some updates on some of the testing information because I wanted to talk to somebody at the FDA and my understanding and response from them, and he's not here to testify, so I'd want to validate this, was that he talked about upwards of two million tests, those aren't individual test kits, but the ability to test two million times, we're, we're coming to availability this week, three million more in the next week, and that we've got a rather large and robust testing uh, ability coming to market shortly, that we've got private enterprises producing these tests, we've got universities, state uh, public officials that have the ability to test, and that we are now getting to the place of scalability to ramp up and have a fairly sizable large amount of testing ability in our robust federal system. Would you agree, Dr. Redfield, that that is the trajectory of where we're headed? Since March uh, 2nd, there's been, I've been told, over 4 million tests now to have entered the market. But what I want to say, the test isn't the whole answer. Right. 
You need people to do the test, mm -hmm. laboratory equipment to do the test. You need some of the reagents that actually now are in short supply to prepare the test. You need the swabs to take the test. So we're working very hard with the FDA to make sure all these different pieces, you know, right now the actual test to do this coronavirus test, I think we have the test in the marketplace. The, the question is how to, how to actually operationalize them. And I think that's what Tony and I are saying is the big challenge right now. Well, and, and I appreciate that because that goes to the hardest. There's a lot of rhetoric flying around both sides of the aisle, all over the place about tests, test kits, testing, and what we can do. We have a significant amount of scalability in this country that we've got to leverage for our benefit, but also recognize we have 330 million people. That's compared to 50 million in South Korea. We have different, uh, we have a federal system, we have states, we have to navigate through that, and we need to make sure that we have the right tests and that the tests are effective. There's some questions, as I talked last night, about whether the Korean test was as effective as we might prefer. There's some debate about that. So is that a fair statement about making sure that we're working through to make sure we've got the right tests while we're working to make sure we've got all of the materials? By the way, remembering that we've got supply chain issues we've got to deal with, given the, the worldwide uh, uh, connection in the supply chain. Yeah, a, a critical regulatory role that the FDA really holds, which is important, that we have tests that actually work, and we actually can be assured of that. I can tell you that the tests that are currently being put out, both by to the public health labs and by LabCorp and the private labs, um, they actually work. The challenge is really, and this is what I want to really emphasize, is we focus so much on the actual kit of the test. Right. We have to focus now on the whole the whole system to get that testing really rolled out, both for surveillance, which is CDC's main job, and to clinical medicine. Um, the, the, uh, an assertion was made a little bit earlier, or a question was raised about who's in charge, right? Um, it, it, one of the uh, difficulties of a uh, federal republic like ours, right, is that there isn't one person in charge of making all of this happen, right? But isn't that also, you know, some people might say that's a bug versus a feature. Some might argue that it's a feature with the 50 laboratories of democracy, with 50 states and universities and labs being able to produce different ways of coming up with testing and navigating this, and our markets being able to scale up and produce, that that's something, again, keeping in mind that the American people are listening and that we're trying to explain how this system works, that there isn't a singular top-down approach in our country to doing this, but that is the same America that has, you know, stomped out Nazism, that has put a man on the moon, that has cured polio, that has gone through and done the things that were reacted to 9-11, built and rebuilt southern Manhattan, that this is the America that rises up to deal with these kind of solutions. And I think it's important that we talk about that in its complexity and its wholeness. I'd like to make one comment, because um, Bob Cadillac's here, and he is in charge of our overall, what we right. call incidents management structure, maybe he would like to comment. I appreciate that, Dr. Kellogg. Well, thank you, sir, and, uh, and thank you, Dr. Redfield. Very simply, uh, given the nature of our system, and particularly the federal government, where there are health components across the domain, Department of Defense, VA, Department of Homeland Security, the responsibilities fall to my position to basically manage and integrate and synchronize those efforts so we can kind of come with a unified response, most importantly, to support state and local authorities right. in disasters. Thank you, Dr. Cadillac. Uh, Madam Chair, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Kelly, is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of you for being here. I know you've been working very hard, and I've seen you multiple times myself. I'm the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust, and also my district is urban, suburban, and rural. Uh, when I hear you talk about there's 30 states that have been uh, affected so far, but within those states, do you see it more? urban or is it a mixture and I know and I'm talking about the people that have it by no obvious means not the people that were in Italy and where they go back to live but just the people that are getting it by not an obvious means yeah just for clarification when Tony and I were mentioning the 30 out of 35 it was really at a time for the analysis that comes from Europe as of this morning now we have 44 states oh. and and the District of Columbia uh, that have reported at least one case um, and I will say that uh, I'm not going to comment in the distribution. I can get that exact information for you. Um, but it is, we're, you know, we are seeing more and more jurisdictions report their initial case uh, across the country now. I think this is one of the big reasons why the president made the decision. We need to use our efforts right now to really continue to try to contain this outbreak with the cases we have and let the public health system focus on that around those clusters 
do aggressive mitigation, but if we continue to have individuals coming in that seed new communities all through the country, it will be very hard for us to get control of this. And that's why this is sort of an integrated, multi-layered public health approach right now. But don't underestimate the importance of our local public health system to do their public health job. It still is something we shouldn't give up on. Yeah, well, I, I won't, but my concern also is in underserved communities, they have a lack of access to, you know, some of the public health or health care. It's, it's, I will say it's our concern, too. I mean, we're trying to look at uh, strategies now for homeless populations. We're, we really are uh, concerned for uh, um, really all of America. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is a doctor I know told me that she received a fax, and the fax said that she could, uh, I'm trying to think of her exact words, work around or go around the CDC and get test herself and swab the nose like you talked about, and then Quest Lab would pick up the test, is that correct? She's in New Jersey. Yeah, that's correct. Again, getting the, uh, again, the spirit of America, when we, Vice President met with all of the major diagnostic companies, they didn't come there as individual companies. They said, we're in this together, how can we step up? And they're all moving up. Quest and LabCorp being the biggest, uh, they're all, they're, they're activated their, their entire system and they're beginning to phase those tests in. The real kick will come when they are able to transfer the platform from the platform that we developed to what we call this high throughput platform, which I'm told should happen soon. They're working hard to validate that with the FDA so they can go to the high throughput platform, like New York State was validated yesterday, Chair, Chair, Chairwoman. So they're up and running with the high throughput platform now. And then also quarantine is for those exposed but not yet sick. But if someone in quarantine get sick, do you switch them to isolation on site or move them to a private hospital? What happens? Yeah, if they do get sick, and we, of course, someone's in self-isolation or self-quarantine self at home, uh, they're being monitored for symptoms. If they, if they do become symptomatic, they get a, a, a comprehensive medical evaluation and then obviously either return to home isolation, if it's that, that's the medical appropriate decision for them, that it's just a sore throat, or if they look like they need medical uh, attention, they're going to get hospitalized and managed in isolation. And then how are those costs covered for a private hospital? Does CDC cover their out-of-pocket costs, or how does that work? Um, well, the uh, department has the authority to reimburse those, okay. The CDC has the authority. The department has authority. The department, we're, we're working now to determine the best way to accomplish that. And have you, uh, maybe someone asked you this, looked over the legislation that we will be considering today? Have you? I haven't seen the legislation. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Keller, is recognized for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to the panel for being here again today. I, I know there's Thanks, been a lot Mr. of Chair. things that have happened, and we've actually been trying to, I know we did this supplemental appropriation and, and, and made the funds available, also communicating with many federal and, and state agencies to make sure we get information out to our constituents. Uh, so that's a lot of what we've done. Uh, even this morning had a couple briefing, a bipartisan briefing in the, in the Capitol Visitor Center, also on the phone with the White House and some other, some other people. Uh, in addition to that, in Pennsylvania, our Secretary General, or Physician General, excuse me, Physician General of the Commonwealth, Dr. Rachel Levine, um, actually had a call with all members of our, our delegation and members of the Pennsylvania General Assembly to go over what the Wolf administration is doing. Uh, so there's been a lot of activity as far as what I've seen trying to make sure people are informed. I know we talk about social distancing, so maybe I can just cover that because I know one of my colleagues had a, had a question about that too. You mentioned social distancing, but what does that mean for I, I know we talked about a lot of sporting events and schools, but are there any other private events where, where people might want to think about social distancing and what might those places be? I'll have Tony add, but we're, we're giving out guidance in terms of the uh, size of events that should happen, you know, uh, and, uh, and really uh, discouraging people from having large events. And now it's different in different communities by the kinetics of the outbreak right now. Um, and we're looking at each community to develop it. That's why we put our matrix out there. Social distancing is we want people to stay six feet away or more. Okay. So if you, you, if you can have an event and keep people outside and they can stand 10 feet away from each other, 
You know, that's, that's how we refer to social distancing. But you see, we really are in a, in a mode that this is time for big events like March Madness, big events like these big sports arena things to take a pause for the next four to six to eight weeks while we see what happens with this outbreak in this nation. Okay, th thank you. And, and again, I, I'm going to reference back what the Physician General had, had said so far, because I know there's been a lot of questions about testing. And uh, Dr. Levine said, so far in Pennsylvania, in every case where a doctor deemed a COVID-19 test to be medic medically necessary, that test was performed. So that's according to Dr. Rachel Levine. She later went on to, to say that the state has the capacity to do the, to do, uh, the number of tests per day that they, they need to or that they can do their capacity. And mentioned actually LabCorp and Quest Diagnostics are now able to provide the tests in Pennsylvania. Uh, and these companies will report any positive results to the state uh, and they will be made public. So it, it appears like Pennsylvania, you know, the, the uh, fifth largest state by population in the nation and the, the world's 18th largest economy has, has sort of figured this out. Because she goes on to say, we will meet the, meet, we will meet the demand for testing and we're, we're following the guidelines to do that. So Pennsylvania is able to do that. Uh, what things might have happened in Pennsylvania that, that we could put in place in other parts of the, the country if they're having trouble with testing? Thank you, Congressman. I think the big issue is just effective communication um, because, you know, Quest and LabCorp is really uh, in all of the states in the country uh, moving forward. We've gotten um, all the public health labs have gotten the resources from um, CDC, I was told by the head of the American Public Health Labs uh, in, uh, in the last 24 hours that he's gone through all the public health labs and not a single lab lacks uh, the kit, the reagents, the capacity to do testing right now. So I do think a lot of it is just effective communication. Well, it seems, it seems like uh, Dr. Levine and the people in the Pennsylvania Department of Health seem to be headed in the right path, so I, I'm glad for that, and I'm just, I'm just hopeful that we can replicate that. I would just like to add my congratulations to them. I mean, I know Rachel well. Uh, they're a very serious health department, and they've stepped up. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fauci, what can we do as, as Congress to continue to work with the Trump administration and state health agencies to ensure that the public health experts and private sector health care providers have what they need to continue to respond to COVID-19? I believe you've already done that in a, to a big extent by the supplement that you've done, the $8.3 billion supplement, which really allowed us to do the kinds of things. Each of us are responsible for different aspects of the response. I know, f speaking for myself and my agency, the NIH, the amount that we got from that supplement, that we will get from that supplement, will be allow us to really accelerate what we've done in the arena of therapy as well as the development and acceleration of vaccines. So I want to thank you for that. That's probably the most important thing. The other thing I think is important is what you're doing right now to have the opportunity to come before you within reasonable, you know, you don't want to come every day, but to come enough to be able to really get the American public to really hear from us because this is an evolving situation. It's not static. It's not one off and you're done. It's going to just evolve over the next several weeks. I just want to add one point. Uh, it's been so important. Um, CDC just announced that we're going to award over $560 million to the front lines of this response. That's the local, state, and territory health departments. Thank you. Does the gentleman yield back? Yeah, yield back. Sir. Thank you. Uh, the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett, is recognized for five minutes for, for, her, for such time as you, you may consume. No, well, let's not do that. Um, I could talk for a long time. But thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. And I want to thank you, gentlemen. I was there at the briefing that you had this morning. I know that you went over to the Senate. You were here yesterday, and you've come back. And so your openness is really appreciated, and the information that you're sharing with us that we will get out to the American people to try and make sure that the right information is there. One of the things that I just want to mention that I'm concerned about is as we are doing this containment and we close schools, there is a digital divide in this country um, where young people will have issues with keeping up with work. In some of the areas, the urban areas that my colleague, uh, Ms. Kelly, was talking about, in the Virgin Islands, we have the highest broadband capacity in the United States outside of New York City, 
but the lowest rate of connectivity to homes. And so these are the things that I think we also need to be concerned about. We're looking at supporting economies, but just our children alone, as well as the issues of health and nutrition that I think many kids will face if they're restricted from going to school when so many of them rely on school lunches and breakfasts for their nutrition. But I wanted to ask you about isolated areas like the Virgin Islands. Um, we're concerned right now. We have an individual of interest that has been isolated, um, but like ourselves and Puerto Rico, like Puerto Rico is like us, we have not fully recovered from um, the hurricanes of 2017. We have seven hospital beds available between the two hospitals for a population of over 100,000. That is tr very troublesome. Um, as to what's going to happen to us. So I'm glad that you said, Dr. Redfield, that you have the funds you believe in place now to do a, a response. Can you tell me, um, one, in terms of personnel, what, um, Dr. Cadlick, I think you would be the appropriate person, how do we get these out? How do you get your personnel out? Because along with a shortage of beds, we also have a shortage of personnel. Thank you, ma'am, for the question. I mean, there are two elements to our ability to respond to these kinds of scenarios, and one is through our National Disaster Medical, Disaster Medical Assistant Teams, or DMATs, and those are uh, intermittent federal employees who uh, work across the nation at some of the premier hospitals and medical institutions around the country, Mass General, Stanford, the like. And so, obviously, in a scenario when there's a, a potential event of this nature where it can happen anywhere and everywhere in the country, uh, are we have to be very selective in how we do that. And we have been deploying those assets uh, to respond uh, to events. Uh, so that's one part of it. The other part of it is with the Public Health Commission Corps, who are a vital member of our, uh, of our if you will, team. Mm -hmm. uh, they belong to the Assistant Secretary for Health. Mm -hmm. There's several thousand of them. I think the intent of Admiral Jouar, though he's not here today, is to expand their um, expeditionary role to serve in these kinds of capacities. Today, as we speak in Seattle, uh, in the nursing home um, that is being afflicted by the COVID virus. Uh, there, are, there are almost two dozen Public Health Commission Corps officers that are working to assist healthcare workers there. So With now are you assets. able to bring people to locations yeah. that are in need? And how do you prioritize what those locations are? Well, obviously it's gonna be based on the need and mm -hmm. based on what the capabilities are domestically or, or in, in that area. So uh, based on our conversation before this hearing, I've already contacted my principal deputy about uh, your situation and our intent to find ways that we can augment or support what is needed for, for your constituents. Great. Plasky, can I yes, mention something please, really quick? I'm sorry, I can't help myself because I, I, I do work on disaster recovery and mm -hmm. work with FEMA. And uh, I've been to the Virgin Islands before, after Hurricane Irma. And uh, I would suggest that you, you talk to FEMA as well because you know, they do have an open, still an open disaster declaration on the island. Um, you know, I've been to the hospital in St. Croix. I know it's destroyed. I know they have a temporary hospital. So, Well, we don't have a temporary hospital. It's not yet. yet. It's been approved Right. two so years later. I, I suggest you contact FEMA because they have a lot of people on the ground there and in sure. Puerto Rico and, um, and, and check with them on what, what, what they can do under the, under the umbrella of the current recovery. Sure. I mean, I've found that FEMA has been great in disaster uh, initial recovery, but the aftermath and rebuilding is a little slower. Um, the fact that we still, two years later, do not have our mobile unit for a hospital shows that there are gaps in FEMA as well. So I do understand, you know, there's a question of should all of these kinds of things, is this a disaster and should this be all within one umbrella um, so that we're not talking to disparate agencies at the same time? But I agree with you and I believe our governor is having that discussion. The other thing I wanted to bring up um, very quickly is cruise ships and you talk about containment. Um, we know that individuals coming off of a cruise ship cannot be tested immediately. Um, so when you have individuals wh who, places like the Virgin Islands, which rely heavily on tourist populations, what is your advice to us in terms of ensuring that we contain ourselves so that we do not uh, have a, a, a spread of this? Well, ma'am, one thing that is uh, ongoing is that the cruise uh, industry is trying to advance what would be healthy kind of practices for their own uh, for their own cruise ships so they can monitor people. And actually, they've submitted a proposal to the U.S. government kind of outlining what their approach is. I think one of the things they include there is actually monitoring, doing surveillance of their passengers, being able to do testing of their passengers on the boat, 
having medical referral capacity to medevac them if they have to, and even having quarantine capabilities. So that's an ongoing dialogue between the cruise industry and the U.S. government. So I think it's, they see it as an important uh, responsibility to their customers and to their passengers, and, and we agree as well. Mr. Re Dr. Redfield, did you want to add something? Well, we've definitely put out uh, our guidance that we're strongly advising individuals with serious medical conditions, especially the elderly, that they should reconsider all cruise travel at this point. Now, that supports the passengers that are there from being infected by others. But what about those who are passengers and in infecting individuals when they come off of the cruise ship? So, again, this is why it's, it's so important in the surveillance. As we know, there's, I think, 12 cruise ships across the world right now that have been looked at for potential COVID-19. As Dr. Cadillac said, there's very active discussions right now going on to what decisions should be made about the cruise industry at this time. Tony, I don't know if you want to add anything. There was a meeting with the cruise ship executives, the CEOs, to tell them they really got to come forth with a plan to tighten up the protection of people who go on as well as what happens when they go off. So that's... Uh, that's, they've been given the mandate to fix it, and if they don't fix it, then they're going to maybe get some regulations that they don't like. Thank you. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentlewoman from uh, Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, is recognized. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to our esteemed uh, witnesses for returning today. You know, since the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak, we have seen not only the spreading of the virus, but also a rapid spreading of racism and xenophobia. Uh, we have witnessed at the highest levels, in fact, of the Republican Party fanning irresponsibly uh, these flames. Um, one colleague tweeted that everything you need to know about the Chinese coronavirus, unquote. Uh, my district is home to nearly 32% foreign-born residents with more than a quarter immigrating from Asia. This painful rhetoric has consequences. Uh, restaurants across Boston's Chinatown have seen up to an 80% drop in business. And I believe this has everything to do with the rapid spread of misinformation and paranoia. It is critical that we stand against these insightful messages and assuage fear in our communities. And we do that by dispelling untruths and misinformation. Uh, we can only do that by sharing the facts. And that is why I'm grateful to have you here today so that we can get to the truth about this virus. 30,000 residents across my district are uninsured and lack access to health insurance coverage. Many of these people are low-wage hourly workers, food service staff, nursing aides, hotel workers. A day off from work due to illness could mean losing a month's worth of groceries. The CDC's website advises people experiencing symptoms related to coronavirus to stay home and seek out medical care, but it doesn't really address the realities of living uninsured. Uh, Dr. Redfield, if I am a symptomatic hotel worker who is pre-diabetic, uninsured, and lacks the savings to cover the cost of testing and treatment, what specific guidance do you have for me? Very important question. Uh, obviously, uh, we want you to be able to stay at home. And this, I think, uh, I don't know exactly where it is, Tony, but I think that there's clearly a great recognition of this issue by the White House Task Force. And uh, I don't know where it is in the, as far as it is you know, in uh, getting its way to you. But I can tell you, we've addressed this as a critical public health component. We need these individuals to be able to do their 14 days at home and not have to sneak out for an hourly job because they have to pay for their cost of living. So I can tell you that the White House Task Force is addressing this. Tony, you want to well, add Dr. anything? Well, Dr. Redfield, if, if I might, will the cost of testing be covered? The cost of testing will be covered. And what about treatment? Cost of treatment will be covered. Okay. And so, and I appreciate that these conversations are happening. In terms of information that is uh, public facing and, and, and accessible to the general public, as of this hearing, neither the CDC's portal for the cor cor coronavirus or its uh, FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions page, has information about what the test costs, who will cover it, and whether uninsured people can be tested. And so this has contributed to the confusion and the panic. So can you please make a commitment today to add this information to the website? 
We will, we will do our best to clarify. Related to costs, particularly for uh, LabCorp and Quest, they haven't really defined it, but they have shown their leadership in rolling it out independent of that. Um, but I will get as much information as I can on that website and keep okay. it updated. So I can take that as an affirmative, a yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Fauci, I'm uniquely concerned about people with autoimmune disorders and those uh, dealing with underlying health conditions um, like HIV or lupus. Briefly, is there any specific guidance for how these vulnerable groups can protect themselves? Uh, they fall into the... That, that's a great question, uh, Ms. Presley. Thank you for asking it. They fall into the category of those that I have been saying multiple times at, at this hearing and other places are in that category that if they get infected, likely many of these people are on immunosuppressive drugs, particularly people with autoimmune disease, uh, that they need to take extra special precaution. In other words, we should, they are vulnerable, and they need to help protect themselves, and society needs to help to protect them. In other words, keep people who are sick away from them, keep them even more stringently apart from crowds, don't travel, unless it's necessary on long trips, and above all, stay away from cruise ships. Okay, all right. So I wanna to turn to another issue. One group we haven't heard much about um, are the 2.3 million people who are in prison or jail. Uh, Mr. Redfield, about 10% of federally incarcerated people are over the age of 60. Many of these people have underlying health conditions, and based on your own criteria, are most at risk for severe complications due to infection from the coronavirus. These individuals often lack access to alcohol-based sanitizer, hand soap, warm water, and regular showers. Uh, Dr. Redfield, yes or no, has the CDC offered guidance to the Federal Bureau of Prisons about the coronavirus? Let me get back to you with the specifics of what we've done. I know we have guidance to the correctional system in general, but rather than answer or give you a half answer, let me get back to you and I will do that today. Okay, so not a yes or a no, unsure. I, we'll I just want to be that. accurate. Okay. okay, all right. So, you know, certainly prisons can be incubators for infectious disease, and that puts those in prison at risk, as well as those who are employed there. What recommendations and protocols has the CDC provided to federal, state, and local correction systems about preventing or responding to an outbreak? And again, uh, Congresswoman, I want to, uh, I will get back to you today. I want to be accurate with my response. Okay, so you'll get back later today. I will. All right, thank you, Doctor. Um, and just because the, the administration um, has touted uh, and expressed commitment to criminal justice reform as a priority, um, you know, this president has granted less commutations than the prior administration. However, with overcrowding, the federal correction system is a breeding ground for deadly outbreak. Dr. Fauci, has the president or any member of the task force raised clemency power as a method of preventing a potentially devastating outbreak? To my knowledge, no, but I, you know, I, I, they may have done it not in my presence, but to my knowledge, they have not. Okay. All right, thank you, and I yield. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Ohio, Ranking Member Jordan, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. As much time as he may consider. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate our, our witnesses being here today. I'm going to yield again to Dr. Green and let him uh, have uh, some follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, I want to make a couple of points and then ask some questions. Uh, the first point I wanted to make is on the uh, 2015 biodefense study uh, that was done under the Obama administration. The Trump administration has followed that. Uh, that recommended that the vice president be the person in charge of the task force, and uh, President Trump's administration has followed the recommendations of the Obama administration on that. I just want to be clear about that because uh, there has been some criticism. Uh, on the South Korean tests, we've had a lot of comparisons of how they've uh, done testing much faster than us. Uh, I, I have a letter from the FDA that says the South Korean test, I want to make sure this is on the record, the South Korean test is not adequate. Uh, a vendor wanted to purchase it and sell it and use it in the United States, and the FDA said, I'm sorry, we will not even do a, an emergency use uh, authorization for that test. So I, uh, I have that letter if anybody wants to see it. Uh, Dr. Roush, I'd like to ask you a question about the DOD and their, uh, as I understand it, they have assessed field hospital resources, they have their ICU beds, their ventilators, you've got the count. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what the DOD is prepared uh, for or has, has looked into should we exceed private hospital bed capacity? 
yes, thank you for that, for that question. We, we have done a uh, current assessment of our military treatment facilities. We, we know the number of beds. We know the, the amount of staff per bed. We know the um, amount of occupied beds. Uh, we know the ICU capability. Um, and we know our alternatives for um, increasing the number of beds and increasing the staff for those for those beds. We also know the inventory of our um, personal protective equipment for the medical force. So that's for the um, that, that's for the um, uh, the MTS. Uh, we also have done an assessment and we know the current capability, uh, the current status of our uh, military operational deployable medical assets. So we have that, we're ready to respond. Um, uh, we stand ready, um, um, you know, um, to respond to the commander in chief's needs. As, as the nation needs, thank you. I wanna ask, and I think the question might be best for Dr. Fauci. I, you know, we, a lot, most of the people on this uh, panel were not scientists. Uh, I consider myself to have the equivalent of an orange belt uh, in this. You know, I know just enough to get myself in trouble. Um, but, I, you know, the rapidity, the, the speed with which you guys have gotten this vaccine up and, you know, ready to go into stage one is uh, unprecedented. It, it, it is breaking records and uh, I, I want you to just brag a little bit on yourselves. Tell us how hard that is and, and why we should all be very grateful for the folks that have put that together. Well, why don't I just describe what it is instead of self-congratulating? <laughs> okay, that's fine. That's fair. All right. So um, it really is the culmination of a lot of basic research over the years, and we thank the committee, as always, for the you know, the kind of support that Congress has given the NIH, which not only does research ourselves, but funds investigators throughout the country and the world. Um, the platform that we use, and, and, and we're not, this isn't the only one, there are a, more than a handful of vaccines going, but the ability to use technologies that we never had before to take the sequence, so that the Chinese didn't have to send us the virus. They just published the sequence on a public database we knew the gene that would code for the protein that we wanted to make our vaccine. So all we did was pull the information right out of the database. We made it, synthesized it very easily overnight, stuck it in to our platform, and started making it. And we said at that point that it would take, I would say, two to three months to have it in the first human. Um, I think we're going to do better than that, and I would hope within a you know, a few weeks we may be able to make an announcement to you all that we've given the first shot to the first person. Having said wow. that, I want to make sure people understand, and I say that over and over and over again, that doesn't mean we have a vaccine that we could use. Right. We mean it's record time to get it tested. It's going to take a year to a year and a half to really know if it works. Right. I really did want to be clear on that, too, and thank you. If I could ask or make one other quick statement, Madam Chairman, and I'll be very fast. You've got I to be fast because we're being told that they have been, voting. this is their okay. third meeting of the day, and uh, we have to go back to a strict five minutes because they have to leave soon. Real, I'll be okay. real quick. Over the weekend, the cruise ship, I had a constituent call. There were meds that she had run out of because the ship was still at sea. I called HHS. They found somebody at Coast Guard. They flew that woman's medications out to the ship. You guys are doing great work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. And the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Talib, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry that I'm all the way in the corner here. But I, I really think this is an important conversation about uh, the extent and in, 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 in making sure we have access to information for our residents at home. You know, earlier this week, Congress's attending physician told the Senate that he expects between 70 to 150 million people to eventually con contract the coronavirus in the United States. Dr. Fauci, is, is he wrong? Um, the, it's Congress's attending physician. Yeah, um, 
I think we really need to be careful with those kinds sure. of predictions because that's based on a model. So what the model is, all models are as good as the assumptions mm -hmm. that you put into the model. So if you say that this is going to be the likely percent of sure. individuals. So who, what, what can we do to define it? Is it testing? No, no, it's unpredictable. So sure. testing now is not going to tell you how many cases you're going to have. Mm -hmm. What will tell you what you're going to have will be how you respond to it with containment and mitigation. So I just want to um, make a point that's, that, that I hope the public gets. When people do model, they say, this is the lower level, this is the higher level, and what the press picks up is the higher level. And they'll say you could have as many as. Remember, the model during the Ebola outbreak said you could have as many as a million. We didn't have a million. Okay. Oh, that's great. Okay, so I spoke to federally accredited clinics in my district, and one of the things that they are noticing in, is capacity regarding their frontline kind of healthcare workers um, and, and various hospitals that rely on about one hospital in my district relies on 1,000 Canadian nurse, nurses from Canada that come across. I think the total for the whole state of Michigan is 3,000. So they're very worried about borders being closed and not getting access to those really frontline communities that need, need, need help. Um, I do want to, to air it for, for folks, and this could be a question to Dr. Cadlick. I, I, I'm really concerned about this because one of the federally accredited clinics said, you know, that is her biggest worry, is that folks are not gonna be able to come back to work, and what are we doing to prepare those individuals? In the meantime, while you do this, I do want to just submit for the record, Congressional Doctor predicts 70 to 150 million U.S. Um, uh, article on these U.S. coronavirus cases. So, and, and this is important because I think we need to continue with a sense of urgency uh, and not try, because the more we do that, I think the more important is that my colleagues understand the supplemental bill that now is being told to be holed up for two weeks for help to communities like ours around the country is now being held up and politicized when this is really, there is no R or D next to this coronavirus. It needs to be able to move forward so we can get virus. But Mr. Cadillac, can you answer the question because this is exactly what I heard from the hospital, two of the hospitals, and uh, two of my federally accredited. Well, ma'am, two, two parts to deconstruct your question. One is about the question about whether or not border crossings would be inhibited, and, and I would have to refer to the Department of Homeland Security. But the other one, there are some work practices that have to be evaluated. There have been others who have questioned about whether or not the issues of furloughs are necessary for people who have been exposed or potentially at risk for coronavirus and how that works. I mean, in the state of Washington, for example, there are healthcare workers who are actually working, uh, they're coronavirus positive, but asymptomatic, and they're continuing to work on coronavirus patients so that they don't pose a hazard to someone who's not ill with coronavirus. So there are some issues that have to be sorted out there, uh, but I will have to go back, and, and for your question about the border control issue, mm -hmm. I would have to make that reference to uh, DHS. Yeah, and I'll follow up as well. I mean, my last thing is, Dr. Redfield, um, you know, I think it's really important for this body, and I think both of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle would want you to commit to providing the committee the current plan of how many tests that you can produce right now, what the plan is, whether they're expected to be ready, and how many people they will cover. Um, and I don't know if you can do that uh, and, and make sure you work with our chairwoman in getting that information to us by the end of this week. I can tell you that we are trying to stand up a national reporting mechanism that's going to put not just the CDC test, not just the public health lab test, but the lab court test, the lab court quest test, and the individual hospital lab so that we can have a single site where people can see how many tests have been done, how many tests are positive. And behind that, we're trying to look at least in the public health system or, you know, what is our current inventory in the public health system. And I can obviously relate that to my colleagues to see if there's a way for us to do that in the clinical system. But yeah, we will have a, yeah. we will, we have it now, but it's, it's, it's incomplete because the states truthfully lag in their reporting because they're actually trying to yeah, do. Yeah, I don't know if that's a yes or no, but get us the plan, that would be great. I think one of the things too is, you know, I, I caution us because we're also worried about the commercialized economy stopping, but we shouldn't be risking our lives for corporate greed. We should really be taking care of our families. And when we don't pass a supplemental, that has been worked on hard from frontline people, various departments, of making sure we have, you know, 
people that have to not go to work. I mean, I'm telling you, one of my state agencies right now where you go get your IDs closed down because people didn't show up to work because they want to make sure they're, they're getting protection, that they are being able to uh, get access to testing and all those things. And I think it's really critically important that we understand that urgency because on the ground, offices are being closed, businesses are being closed right now, not just large events. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, the gentle lady from California, Ms. Porter, is recognized for five minutes. Dr. Cadillac, for someone um, without insurance, do you know the out-of-pocket cost of a complete blood count test? No, ma'am, not, not immediately. Do you have a ballpark? Uh, out of, with a copay, ma'am? No, the out-of-pocket, just the, the typical cost. Uh, I do not, ma'am. Okay, the CBC, a CBC typically costs about $36. What about the out-of-pocket cost for a complete metabolic panel? Ma'am, I'd have to pass on that as well. You have any idea? You want to take a ballpark? I would say $75. Okay, 58 Getting closer. How about flu A, the flu A test? Ma'am, again, I would take a guess at about maybe 50 43 Flu, this is like the price is right. Flu B? Too high again. I would, I would probably say 44. That's good. How about the cost of an ER visit for someone identified as high severity and threat? I'm sorry, ma'am, what was the question again? How about the cost of an ER visit for somebody identified as having high severity or high threat? High severity, but ma'am, that's probably about three to $5,000. Okay, that is $1,151. It, this all totals up to $1,331. That's assuming they aren't kept in isolation. Isolation can add up for one family already, $4,000. And fear of these costs are gonna keep people from being tested, from getting the care they need, and from keeping their communities safe. We live in a world where 40% of Americans cannot even afford a $400 unexpected expense. We live in a world where 33% of Americans put off medical treatment last year. And we have a $1,331 expense, conservatively, just for testing for the coronavirus. Dr. Redfield, do you want to know who has the coronavirus and who doesn't? Yes. Not just rich people, but everybody who might have the virus? All of America. Dr. Redfield, are you familiar with 42 CFR 71.3130? Excuse me. 42 CFR 71.30. Um, the Code of Federal Regulations that applies to the CDC. 42 CFR 71.30. I think if you could frame the, what it talks about, that would help me. I'm, I okay. don't relate Dr. To Redfield, I'm, I'm pretty well known as a questioner on the Hill for, for not, not tipping my hand. I literally communicated to your office last night and received confirmation that I was going to be asking you about 42.7, 42 CFR 71.30. This provides, the director may authorize payment for the care and treatment of individuals subject to medical exam quarantine, isolation, and conditional release. That I know about, and my office did tell me that. I just didn't know the numbers, ma'am. That's Congresswoman. Great. So you're familiar. Dr. Redfield, will you commit to the CDC right now using that existing authority to pay for diagnostic testing free to every American, regardless of insurance? Well, I can say that we're going to do everything to make sure everybody can no, get the care they need. No, not good enough. Reclaiming my time. Dr. Redfield, you have the existing authority. Will you commit right now to using the authority that you have vested in you under law that provides in a public health emergency for testing, treatment, exam, isolation without cost, yes or no? What I'm going to say is I'm going to review it in detail with no, CDC I'm and the department. No, I'm reclaiming my time. Dr. Redfield, respectfully, I wrote you this letter along with my colleagues, Rosa DeLora and Lauren Underwood, Congressman Underwood and Congressman DeLora. We wrote you this letter one week ago. We quoted that existing authority to you and we laid out this problem. We asked for a response yesterday. The deadline and the time for delay has passed. Will you commit 
to invoking your existing authority under 42 CFR 71.30 to provide for coronavirus testing for every American regardless of insurance coverage. What I was trying to say is that CDC is working with HHS now to see how we operationalize that. Dr. Redfield, I hope that that answer weighs heavily on you because it is going to weigh very heavily on me and on every American family. Our intent is to make sure every American gets the care and treatment they need at this time of this major epidemic, and I'm currently working with HHS to see how to best operationalize it. Dr. Redfield, you don't need to do any work to operationalize. You need to make a commitment to the American people so they come in to get tested. You can operationalize the payment structure I tomorrow. I think, I think you're an excellent questioner, so my answer is yes. Excellent. Everybody in America hear that. You are eligible to go get tested for coronavirus and have that covered regardless of insurance. Please, if you believe you have the illness, follow precautions. Call first. Do everything the CDC and Dr. Fauci, God bless you for guiding Americans in this time. But do not let a lack of insurance worsen this crisis. And I would just like to echo what you said. It's a public health, a very important public health that those are... Those individuals that are in the shadows can get the health care that they need during this, this time of us responding to this outbreak. Well, thank you. And the gentle lady from New Mexico, Mrs. Holland, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. We really appreciate um, you, uh, you answering our questions. Um, uh, Dr. Redfield, I first I want to start with you first. Um, the first four cases of coronavirus have been found in New Mexico, my state. Uh, we had a conference call with Governor Lujan Grisham yesterday, and uh, she mentioned that one, uh, two of the cases, it's a couple who lives in Socorro, New Mexico, uh, a small town, uh, you know, uh, 70,000 people perhaps, uh, and they were on a cruise ship themselves. Uh, they came back to New Mexico. Nobody notified uh, the state or the health department about them being on a cruise ship, cruise ship where coronavirus was found. So they were in New Mexico just doing their normal everyday life for 10 entire days before uh, the governor or the state was alerted to have them tested, and it turned out they were positive. So uh, I am, uh, you know, we're of course worried in a small town like that, uh, the virus could spread pretty rapidly. And so I want to, a lot has been, a lot of attention has been paid to testing. Will we have adequate testing? And, and I want, you know, I'd like to know this adequate testing, uh, I have to believe that it will reveal an exponential number of cases throughout the country and um, how, what, what is the responsibility to just um, make sure that we are getting this information out to people? People on a cruise ship where coronavirus was known to be found uh, shouldn't be walking around for 10 whole days before uh, we're alerted to that fact. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Obviously, the complexity of tracking down people, whether it's ships or planes, is a complicated issue. First, you have to have accurate contact information. Um, and I can tell you one of the things with the uh, uh, interim fer federal rule we recently did for airlines, in the past, maybe 20 to 30 percent of the information we would get would be actually actionable. I'm happy to say now we're probably over 90 percent. We're getting the manifest from cruise ships and working with local health departments to try to track down these individuals when we do have a confirmed case. Um, and this is why Dr. Fauci and all of us have now really weighed heavily, this is not the time to be cruising. Uh, we really do realize that these are um, uh, environments that can really amplify transmission. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Redfield, thank you. Um, I want to turn our attention, uh, I think you've mentioned, all, you know, all of you have mentioned several times today that Big crowds need to be avoided. Is that correct? And I want, uh, first of all, uh, I, I want to just talk about our president for a moment. On March 8th, he tweeted uh, that fake news media is doing everything possible to make us look bad. On February 28th, he called uh, the coronavirus a democratic hoax in, the, in front of a huge rally, which was on national TV. 
um, a Brazilian official who, was, who uh, met with uh, President Trump at Mar-a-Lago has just tested positive for the virus. And he has just boasted recently about his March 25th rally in Florida that it's all sold out, and he has yet to cancel it. And this behavior, this is a behavior that our country has to contend with. He's our president. He is the leader of our country. You have been sitting here for hours and yesterday telling us that we need to avoid big crowds. And I'm going to tell you that I have Republicans in my district who I care deeply about. I don't want them getting infected. Every single one of us here have constituents all over our districts who we don't care who they support for president. We don't want them getting sick. And I, I applaud my governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, who just canceled all mass gatherings in our state. And I almost feel like saying the president can do whatever he wants. He's an adult. He can be careless with his own health if he wants to. That's his choice. But the millions of Americans who would go to a rally because he has told them that it's a hoax, they don't know the truth, apparently. And it's up to all of us to make sure that they do know the truth. And, if, if, and I understand the position you're in. If you can't tell the president to his face, stop all your rallies, cancel every single rally that you have planned because American lives are at stake, then I implore you to give that message to every governor of every state in this country. We have to, we have to stop this where it is, and I appreciate you uh, you being here, and thank you, Madam Chair, I yield. The member's time has expired. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, is recognized for five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks to the panel. Um, Dr. Fauci, I've been trying to sort of distill the um, testing issue uh, against the backdrop of moving from containment to mitigation. And in my mind, and I'd like you to maybe just comment on it very briefly, our failure to get the testing done early in effect means we missed the containment window and now have to move rapidly to the mitigation stage of this thing. In other words, you've kind of been intimating, don't wait for the surveillance testing, don't wait for the person-to-person -person testing um, to make a judgment about what we have to do. We are past containment, well past it. There might have been a moment when we could have had an effective strategy around there if the testing had been deployed better. Um, but we now got to go straight to mitigation in anticipation of the fact that whatever testing will now happen will show us that community spread has been happening for weeks and so forth. Is that a fair characterization? Uh, with all due respect, uh, sir, uh, it's not totally fair. And let, let me very briefly try and uh, integrate what you said, part of which was true, but part of which I think is a little, maybe a little misleading. First of all, clearly we've said many times, and I've said publicly, we had a problem with the testing, and if we needed the kind of surveillance, we're not there yet. I don't think you could draw a direct line to that lack of having it in the beginning to the fact that we're now doing mitigation. Number two, Fair you, don't, you, don't, you don't necessarily give up containment when you go to mitigation. You can do some containment at the same time you're doing mitigation. But I would emphasize, and I'm glad you're giving me the opportunity to state it yet again, because you could never state it too much, is that right now, all of us, regardless of what testing is going on, need to be doing the kind of distancing, avoiding crowds, teleworking where possible. I said it many times, and I'll say it again, this is not business as usual. If you live in a state or a region where there are just a few or no cases, it doesn't matter. You really need to do the Let me ask you, thank you. That's a very good clarification. Right. Let me ask you a science question sure. just so I understand. If somebody got the virus three, four weeks ago, just thought they had the flu or a bad cold or something, recovered from it, um, they're now essentially immune from getting the virus again. Is that correct? 
We haven't formally proved it, but it is strongly likely that that's the case. Okay. Because if this acts like any other virus, once you recover, you won't get reinfected. And if they then came down with another cold, not related coronavirus, thought maybe it was coronavirus, got tested, would that test show that they had gotten the coronavirus or not? If you do an antibody test, if you wait weeks and months after you've recovered, the antibody test will tell you whether that person was formally infected with coronavirus. Okay. Um, following up on that, if somebody um, <clears throat> has the immunity and in, in that sense is not a carrier, they could still transmit, right, if they were in a space where they got the virus somehow on their skin or something else, so they could still put someone else at risk, even though in their mind they're thinking, I'm now immune and therefore I'm safe to move around in a sense. Is that true? No. Absolutely not. Thank okay. you for asking the question. So let's say I get infected. And whether I get sick or not, I clear the infection from my body. I do two tests 24 hours apart, which is the standard to say I'm no longer infected. A month and a half from now, you do an antibody test, and that test is positive. I am not transmitting to anybody because my body has already cleared the virus. So even though my antibody test says you were infected a month or two ago, right now, if there's no virus in me, I am not going to be able to transmit it to anyone. I ask you a slightly different question. I'm going to run out of time, so I'll come down maybe, or I'll, I'll ask you offline so I understand that better. I did in the last 25 seconds here, though, just want to say that I'd like to follow up um, Dr. Cadlick, I believe, in terms of the, the federal government's plans around telework, because obviously that's going to be critical in terms of continuity of operations. A lot of folks are already doing that on a discretionary basis, but I'm going to be interested in what the, the agency-wide response is there. I do, I do have something I'd like to enter into the record, uh, Madam Chair, which is, a, is testimony from AFGE, uh, in part relating to the importance of telework and what they would like to see in that space, and I'd ask unanimous consent to submit that for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, Last night, President Trump announced that starting on Friday at midnight, he is suspending all travel from and to uh, Europe to the United States for the next 30 days. Only the United Kingdom and appropriately screened Americans are exempted from this ban. C the CDC previously recommended that all Americans avoid travel to China, Iran, South Korea, and Italy. It has recommended that older adults or those with chronically me chronic medical conditions propose postpone travel to Japan. Dr. Fauci, um, will a travel ban like this have significant impact on reducing the community spread of the coronavirus? That is, cases that are already in the United States. Yes, that is the, the answer is a firm yes. And that was the reason, the rationale, the public health rationale, why that recommendation was made. Because if you look at the numbers, it's very clear that 70% of the new infections in the world are coming from that region, from Europe, seeding other countries. First thing. Second thing, of the 35 or more states that have infections, 30 of them now, or most recently, have gotten them from a travel-related case from that region. So it was pretty compelling that we needed to turn off the source from that region. Can I, let me, so I've been, in a lot of the briefings, I've been listening to you very carefully. What changed between, um, you know, when you were here to last night, when it, to all of a sudden impose this, this ban, this travel ban? Yeah. Well, we, we, as you probably know, as I mentioned, we meet physically once a day, every day, conference calls and telephone calls during the day between briefings. And what happens is that things evolve as you see the cases. And when you look at the data, all of a sudden we had China being the seed. And we did that with China. And then as the days and weeks get by, it became clear it wasn't China anymore. Yeah. It was so, another region. So, so something changed, right? So this was always an option that was always on the table. Yeah. But the dynamics of the outbreak changed. It shifted from a China to the rest of the world uh, to Europe to the rest of the world. And you, you yesterday quoted Gretzky. You want to be where the puck is. Right. right? 
not where it's at, where the puck is going to be. Yes, indeed. Do you expect that the administration will issue additional travel restrictions in the future? I think if, in fact, the dynamics of the outbreak uh, mandates that, they would seriously consider that. I can't say yes or no, but I can tell you it would be seriously considered. Okay. Uh, Dr. Redfield, what other countries is the CDC watching for similar recommendations? Well, as, uh, as Dr. Fauci said, uh, you know, clearly it was Korea and Italy and Iran that really became our next uh, epicenters. Uh, unfortunately, because of Italy spread to the, to the region, now we really have a major regional outbreak now in Europe. Uh, we are continuing to really to watch the whole world at this point in time. It really is Iran, Korea, and, 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 and the mainland Europe that are the epicenters right now. And with Europe driving the global outbreak for sure for the last couple of days. Okay. Um, one of the things that, that has been expressed is that the president also warned older Americans to avoid non-essential travel to crowded places. CDC has recommended um, the vulnerable individuals avoid travel to uh, such as long plane rides and in particular avoid cruises. Um, I know that this means older adults with chronic health um, conditions. What, what is older adults? How do you define that? I mean, I, I, it's not a loaded question. The reason just... I laugh, my, my standard answer is anybody <laughs> older than me, but <laughs> that's not a good answer. The, you know, Being here in Congress, six that are young and I'm 45, so what does that that's, tell you? That's the general. Yeah. But, but I what, think what's the age? Generally, people refer to it as 60, 65 years old, as elderly. However, the thing we need to point out that's important is that there's numerical age and there's physiological age. There's a great deal of variability in the vulnerability of a person based purely on their age. You could have a 75-year-old person who's vigorous and has a really robust immune system. You could have somebody that's 60, 65, not nearly good. It isn't linear yeah. based on just your age. The, the reason why is the reason why we're asking these questions is that the constituents really want specifics, right? Like if I'm above 60 and I'm a marathon, you know, I'm 60 and I'm out of shape, then maybe I shouldn't be traveling. Am I, if I'm 70 or older and I'm a marathoner and I do X, Y, and Z and I'm like my, everything looks great, then it might not be as severe, correct? Or yeah, I was just going to say this is driven by the, the mortality of this infection. Clearly individuals that are under 30, under 40, under 50, we've seen these individuals may get a really severe cold and they recover or they may be asymptomatic. When you look at the mortality in Italy, the average age of death was somewhere between 82 and 84. Uh, when you look at the overall mortality that we're seeing across the China and everything, it's really in the, in the 70s. So we're really trying to get the most vulnerable mm -hmm. out of a, an environment where they may catch this virus. Okay. The member's time Thank has you. expired. Thank you. And the gentle lady from the District of Columbia Ms. Nellinger, Holmes Norton is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, gentlemen, we are here in the nation's capital where a state of emergency has been declared by the mayor of the District of Columbia. This is a tourist mecca. Uh, millions come from all over the world and all over the country. I'm concerned about our health care providers uh, and our first responders. Social distancing is not really an option for them, um, they are, in a real sense, the last line of defense. For example, in New York, we heard of doctors and nurses who had reportedly been exposed uh, to the virus. Let me ask you, Dr. Redford, can any medical provider who wants to be tested today be tested? Again, I think that would be a, a decision that the hospital would make and the, and the individual's physician, but your point the importance of protecting our providers with the proper um, uh, infection control procedures is critical. We put out guidance, um, and we need to continue to so do that. So there needs to be some prioritization of who, obviously, people who have been exposed, but we get beyond that. People who uh, expose themselves, it seems to me, uh, ought to be given uh, first priority. Mr. Uh, uh, Caddock, let me ask uh, what HHS is providing, uh, is advising providers to do to ensure that there is not a shortage of medical staff? Yes, ma'am, and I think that's a critical issue here in terms of evaluating not only the personal protective uh, posture of physicians who are managing patients with this particular virus, 
but also those that are working in emergency rooms and in other areas where there, there's a risk they could be exposed in that setting. Uh, a couple areas that are being considered are what are the particular work-related rules as it would require people to be furloughed from work if they were exposed. There was a question earlier about someone being in appropriate protective posture, exposed, and then there was a question whether they would be furloughed. And again, it gets back to your possible question of testing. If that's an appropriate intermediate means to keep a healthcare worker on the job in lieu of that kind of uh, 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 absence or excuse from work. Uh, the, the, our, and we were woke this morning to find that the World Health Organization had officially declared, declared this to be a, a pandemic. I'm worried about personal protective e equipment. I guess I should ask you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Cadillac, will shortages of personal protective equipment, like face masks and gloves, et cetera, hamper uh, public health response? What priority is given to who gets these, uh, this vital equipment? Well, ma'am, that's a great question because, quite frankly, there is a potential risk. Much of the, what we get is from source from overseas. We're working actively with manufacturers and distributors to make sure two things happen. One is that supply chains are uninterrupted. The second thing is allocations go preferentially to healthcare workers over others. Well, is the, health, is the uh, health and Human Services Department taking any steps here in the United States to boost production? Yes, ma'am. Of these supplies? Yes, So that people are, I mean, are these, yes, who is manufacturing these yes. supplies? Is yes, that continuing? Yes, we are. And, and basically, we're, uh, we have released a re request for proposals for a half a billion N95 masks to boost production. We're working with manufacturers to make sure that they have the raw materials which are sourced in the United States so they can surge, and many of them so are. So all the people who make yes, all these supplies, the gloves, and all, they are all boosting. Yes, ma'am. They're, they're boosting, and we're looking to source it from other ways. One thing that I mentioned earlier was, again, the importance for liability protection for some of these manufacturers, particularly around N95 masks. And that should be in our bill, then, yes, that, that we're that working must, on now. That's a must-pass bill because... That's critical to enable more masks. Well, we'll be sure that because we are working on a bill as I speak, trying to make it a bipartisan bill. Finally, let me ask you with, about Italy, uh, because Italy is the worst case scenario. It can educate us about what's, what could happen to us. And I understand that uh, doctors anticipate uh, hospitals running out of beds within a week in Italy if the spread continues. Uh, if the rates continue here, uh, or let me ask you, are we doing anything uh, to keep the United States from running out of beds, for example, in Washington State? Yes, ma'am. In, in fact, we're doing a couple things there, and the state is working with HHS and doing things on their own, but they're using alternate care facilities to offload some of the, some of the people who are mildly ill and putting them in settings that segregate them from regular hospitals so it won't... And in what kind of facilities? Motels, for example. And the same thing is happening in the state of California. HHS is working with the state there to basically identify alternate care facilities for low acuity patients. The one thing that is a concern is whether or not high acuity beds, intensive care beds, could be at risk, and we're monitoring that very carefully. And again, looking for alternative solutions that we could use to make sure that we can take care of anyone who has this virus, but more importantly, take care of people who don't have the virus, but who have other medical needs. Gentlelady's time has expired. And the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay, is our last uh, member to question today. So. Thank you, Madam Chair, for this hearing. And yes, I'm batting cleanup. So <laughs> I'd, I'd like to ask about a story that broke yesterday. According to Reuters, since mid-January, the NSC has ordered HHS to classify top-level discussions related to the coronavirus. The topics of these discussions have reportedly included, and I quote, the scope of infections, quarantines, and travel restrictions. Uh, Dr. Kedlick, is it true that HHS has been holding classified coronavirus? So, we're, so we're holding them in a classified room, but they're, the, the nature and the content of those conversations are not classified. So we've been doing secure video conferencing across the interagency, and that requires going into a classified space. I could see how it would be misinterpreted as such, but the, the nature of the conversations are unclassified. 
And so how many meetings since mid-January have been held? In so there's two numerous to count, honestly. Two numerous. To count. I mean, it, it's, we're meeting several times a day, if not more, at different levels of the organization to basically address critical questions as it relates to the safety and health of Americans, the adequacy of supplies, the adequacy of our health care system. Yeah, but I, it's my understanding that some uh, officials are left out because they don't have the correct uh, um, level of, sir, of security sir, clearance. Sir, that, that is an administrative challenge sometimes because these secure fa uh, places are uh, administered by uh, classification rules that have nothing to do with the content of the conversation, but just the physical access to the place. Yeah. So these individuals have to be escorted in, and again, the nature of the conversations have to remain unclassified in those settings, and they, they are unclassified by the virtue of the content. Does that in, inhibit our ability in any way to get the expertise we need into the room? No, sir. I think in the case of the White, uh, the White House Situation Room, which is the highest level of classification you can have, uh, we have all the appropriate people in the room to make those decisions, including individuals who have no, cl no clear security clearance at all. Uh, according to one official, because these meetings have been held in a skiff, critical government experts have been, been excluded in these discussions. And this practice, quote, seemed to be a tool for the White House, for the NSC, to keep participation in these meetings low. Are you familiar with 28 CFR section 17.22? Well, sir, I'd have to, be, sir, if you hum a few bars, I could probably guess it, but I worked on the Senate Intelligence okay. Committee, and I have to admit, uh, I believe it's related to the, the security practices in these low Here, Here's what, what the section describes, is information shall not be classified in order to conceal inefficiency, violations of law, or administrative error to prevent embarrassment to a person, organization, or agency. Uh, to restrain competition or to prevent or delay release of information that does not require protection in the interest of national security. Uh, information that has been declassified and released to the public under proper authority may not be reclassified. Um, do you know that uh, We've discussed at length today the need for our government agencies to be transparent with the American people, and they deserve answers to be able to protect themselves and their families from this pandemic. Uh, is the information being discussed in these meetings all actually classified under the definition of classified security information? Sure, they, they are totally unclassified, and, and I think it's been the intent of Secretary Azar and our department to be radically transparent, to make sure that anything that we can share, and, and I'll look to my colleagues on the right of me, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Redfield, who've been participants to offer their, their observations as well. Go ahead, Dr. Totally, I totally agree with Dr. Kalik. There, there really is no functional classification. It's merely an access thing. And the people that we need are in there, and there's nothing that we say in there that we're not that we're afraid to say to you right here. Okay, and so you would be willing to share that information with us? That, that we have been. In fact, all okay. the questions we've asked are reflective of what's gone on in that room. Well, and, and I appreciate that, appreciate your openness and transparency, and I, I look forward to working together uh, to resolve the issues that we face as a nation. And with that, I yield back. Madam Chair. Gentleman yields back. And uh, I just want to thank all of you for, for testifying. If, would you like to make a statement, Mr. Redfield? Yeah. Chair, Dr. Well, Dr. Redfield. That's all right. I'd like to just to make two clarifications, mm -hmm. one of which I did yesterday and one of which mm -hmm. I did today, if I could have a second to do Absolutely. That. So yesterday, I want to clarify that when I was asked about manufacturing of the test, the original test, I just want to clarify that CDC did manufacture the original CDC test that we used at CDC, and we also manufactured the initial test we sent out to states. It's uh, an IDT manufactured the kits after that. So I just want to get that on the record. Secondly, in my comments today, I wanted just to clarify that we're currently examining all avenues to try to ensure that uninsureds have access to testing and treatment. 
and we're mm -hmm. encouraging the use of the federally qualified health centers that can do this at reduced or free. And we will continue to update both the Congress and the public on all available resources for this population. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes. Uh -huh. Madam Chairman, I do have one errata from yesterday. I misspoke. I, I, when talking about BARDA, I mentioned they had 53 FDA approvals. I was incorrect. It's actually 54. Well, that's very accurate. Would anyone else like to make a statement? Well, I want to thank all of you for testifying today. We realize that this is the third uh, testimony, third meeting that you've taken today. We appreciate it. We appreciate you coming back. Uh, thank you for your public service, your hard work, your, your dedication. And particularly, I want to thank uh, Dr. Fauci for uh, serving six presidents, six presidents, and uh, uh, speaking so truthfully and honestly to the public as all of you have. I can't tell you how many people have contacted me that they now understand more about it, they feel better about it. It's, uh, you have truly performed an incredibly important public service uh, by speaking really to the American people uh, as you are today on this panel. We thank you so, so very much. And I, I do want to say a very special thank you to Mr. Jordan. This is his last day as ranking member of this committee. We all thank him for his service. He will be moving to ranking member on the Judiciary Committee, but not leaving the committee so we can continue working together. And I understand that you will be taking your staff with you, so I want to thank them for their excellent uh, hard work and also my own staff uh, that has uh, really worked on this hearing and on, on all, all of the matters before it. Uh, I just uh, also understand that you will be going next door, as I understand it. <laughs> so uh, I'm uh, wondering if you would, uh, uh, I, I yield to you. Um, I'm very sorry you're leaving, quite frankly. And, uh, and I've enjoyed working with you. Thank same, you. Same here, Madam Chair. And that was very nice. And I appreciate those kind words. I'm not going far. I'll be sitting right here. So it'd just be one, one seat further. But thank you for your, for your work. And it's been a pleasure to work with you. Thank you to our witnesses again and for the work you're doing for the American people. The American people are very grateful. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. This hearing is adjourned.